Good morning. I want to uh, thank uh, Professor Mir Mirdal and Professor Berthoz uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, this was indeed a, a co-conspiracy of three people here um, to, to really bring this about. Uh, I also want to thank all the speakers who came here really on short notice uh, from the various dis disciplines. This was really arranged uh, only over a period of a few months, but uh, I think everybody felt that this was uh, a, a, a topic that was worth uh, dis discussing. Uh, this is, of course, a very beautiful setting in a very beautiful time of year in a beautiful city, in a structure, in a palace which was built, I believe, in 1674. I think a few stairs uh, up somewhere in a room, uh, I be be believe that Baud Baudelaire resided for some time. So I think we should all be inspired and um, really take this uh, topic under con consideration. I want to first say that I think we all have to uh, be pre prepared to get uh, out of our comfort zones here. And you know, I sort of vol volunteer to do it first. My comfort zone is really neurosurgery. My comfort zone is single neurons, is firing of single neurons. So I'm getting here into a very, uh, a very, um, a, a very uneasy uh, zone here. There is an unease which we will all feel, I think, when we dis discuss this topic. And some people have commented about this uh, unease. So let me uh, start by taking you um, to 1995. Uh, it was a, an in interesting year, partly because, uh, interestingly, a new phylum was discovered in that, that year uh, in the uh, mouse of the Norwegian lobster. Okay, it was called uh, Symbion pan Pandora. It's a jug-shaped microscopic aquatic animal that lives in the mouse of the Norwegian lobster. You can see it on the right. Now this was also an interesting year because uh, you know there was there were several at atrocities which happened in Srebrenica in 1995, and of course just the year prior to to, to that, the uh, unfortunate and horrendous events that happened in Rwanda. Uh, to describe this, you know, this is taken uh, from. Um, from a sim symposium uh, th that was done, uh, I, I believe, in the Holocaust M Museum in Washington. I believe that Dr. B Browning was also a participant. And uh, this is a de description of what happened, really, by uh, Bill Berkeley. It was a low-tech mass slaughter perpetrated by tens of thousands of ordinary men. One of the unique features of the Rwandan genocide, the participation of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of mostly peasants many of them illiterate, most of whom had never killed before, most of whom had no record of criminal activity, who were somehow mobilized. And he continues, say, from village to village, door to door, herding ethnic Tutsis, men, women, and children, taking them into the banana groves and hacking them to death with machetes and in some cases hammers and clubs with nails in them, horrifically barbaric mass slaughter carried out face to face hand to hand. So in fact, the pace of, of killing over three months was probably the, the, the highest in re recorded history. And that happened in 1994. So in 1995, the, the Lancet, uh, you know, had this in the end of 1995, the Lancet looking back at that year, it basically had this um, editorial. It says, Pandora, and the problem of evil. And uh, let's see, uh, no, let's, yeah. So what they said, for biological scientists, 1995, says the Lancet, the, the editor, will be remembered for discovery of the first new phylum in living memory, 
Saclifora, with one member seen beyond Pandora, if only for the surprise that a creature living in the mouse parts of Norwegian lobsters had escaped notice for so long. Forensic psychiatrists and journalists may remember the year for the unusual number of gruesome murders, court cases in France, the UK, and Russia have caused people to ask, are those who kill mad or bad? The nature of these killings carried out by people who seemed otherwise psych uh, psychologically intact has led some commentators to invoke the notion of evil. And as I said, at first glance, as Pandora had little in common with the question of evil, evil lacks an exact definition, whilst as Pandora bizarre appearance and behavior have been stringently classified. What they do have in common is that at the beginning of 1995, any biologist proposing the existence of such a bizarre living organism as es Pandora and its new phylum would not have been believed, nor would anyone have believed a proposal to name a category of behavior defined by a biologic notion of evil. It is too fanciful to suggest that we will soon know what evil is if only to accept its existence as something beyond the reach of forensic psychiatry and outside the safe boundaries of nosology. And they con continue basically saying, until 100 years ago, many bizarre behaviors were explained as manifestation of evil, possession by devils, a result of curses uh, or supernatural retribution for wrongdoing. Scientific inquiry into behavioral abnormalities lagged behind research into physical disease and still does. Yet psychological illness has been classified with an exactness approaching that of physical disease and vitamin deficiencies, poisoning, and inherited defects of metabolism have all been shown to cause behavioral disturbances, including violence. This is the inherited of chromosomal abnormalities and personality trait predisposing to violent behavior is becoming clearer. And they conclude by saying, to deny the possible existence of evil is as scientifically arrogant as claiming that no new phylum of living things could be discovered. Of course, they note Rightly, there, there will be no rush to provide research funds for inquiries into the nature of evil in 1996, probably also for 2016. All we can hope is for serendipity, that a scientist as inquisitive as the one looking in the lobster mouse and marveling at Espandora will come across evil maybe from the preserved brains of those afflicted and recognize it for what it is, something no one has ever seen before. Should that happen, evil will be classified and may even prove reversible. If it does not, those specializing in the psychology of deviance will have to live with the notion that some horrors of human behavior will forever elude them. So it was interesting, of course, that a medical journal would come with that kind of proposal at that time. So that uh, was for, for, for me, when, when I read it, uh, quite so surprising to find this really in a medical journal. So, what is really the problem? And I, I sort of want to bring here, uh, you know, some words from somebody who has really thought a lot about the issue of uh, historical in interpretation of the final solution and the Holocaust. And this is Saul Fried Friedlander, already in 1989, later in a, in a, in a book, uh, essentially is trying to understand, uh, we said most interpreters try to avoid the problem posed by the psychology of total extermination by concentrating exclusively on specific ideological motives or on institutional dynamics. But an independent psychological residue seems to defy the historian. The psychological dimension, whenever recognized, is usually reduced to a vague reference to the banality of evil. Of course, that unease of interpretation cannot but stem from the non-congruence between intellectual probing and the blocking of intuitive comprehension. And of course, if we substitute psychological with biological, we are getting into a new dimension of unease. Because psychological, we can maybe accept, but biological, and beyond biological, medical. So this is a big leap, really. And what he says really, he sort of invoke an interesting uh, concept of the unca uncanny, I guess, Unheimlichkeit. Yes, that probably the German gets more to the core of the concept itself, which was essentially invoked by, by Freud. He was actually quoting Jens, but he says, when there is intellectual uncertainty of distinction between an animate and non-animate object, 
In any case, we cannot but admit on one hand the human orderliness of the perpetrators and notice on the other hand the mechanical non-human aspect of their actions. We are dealing with human beings of the most ordinary kind approaching the state of automata. Then we will of course later deal with the maybe the neuroscientific you know, approach to, to the state of automata and to will, but that's coming. Our sense of, of this uh, uncanny, really, or Unheimlichkeit, is indeed triggered by this deep uncertainty as the true nature of the perpetrator. So, but this, in fact, when you think about it, is a symmetrical issue because the perpetrator's uncertainty about whether the victims are animate or inanimate ob object, hence dehumanization and what we will be hearing about, and at the same time, victims and historians and bystanders uncertainty about the perpetrator's animate versus inanimate object, like that is automatic behavior, in a sense. So, you know, we, we don't need to really invoke all this because we have seen it. It's a recurring theme, and we always see it. We see it in ditches, and, and, and the, the phenomena has a uniformity to it, unfortunately. We, we see the same type of, of behavior, which is an extreme behavior, until, you know, these very, very days. So, you know, thinking about it, and again, uh, moving into another, you know, discomfort zones, the uh, psychological and sociological experiments that were done in the 1960, and really, uh, first, I am no expert on this, and second, there has been obviously a lot of criticism about those studies and what they actually mean, uh, not to speak about the experimental control, not to speak about the ethical issues that arose in those studies. But one thing is clear, those studies have been done, uh, and all of you, most of you are probably familiar with the Milgram experiment, which was a third, es essentially a de de designed to probe the, the issue of conformity to, or to authority, where essentially an ex experimenter uh, is uh, in, in, a, in, in an experiment designed to actually improve memory, supposedly, essentially uh, have the subject sitting and inflicting a electric shock uh, on, a, uh, on somebody who is in the other room and of course knows about the experiments and at the same time feigns or really plays the, uh, the aspect of, of somebody who is experiencing pain. And of course the experimenter assures the subject that everything is fine and things, you know, which starts at, at 15 milli, millivolt eventually, uh, you know, gets to, uh, to a point where a large number of those sub subjects indeed increase the shock and cause pain to somebody by essentially obedience to authority. That was the interpretation. It's really obviously open to, to a lot of criticism, but I think as Zim Zimbardo, I think he has this, this quote, and he says, uh, every evil starts at 15 millivolt. Meaning, meaning that you know, eventually you, know, you get desensitized. So this was obviously one experiment uh, which has, has in, in intrigued a lot. The other is the Stanford Prison Experiment in 1971, and just briefly, to those of you who are not fam familiar with it, is an experiment which to today probably would not have been, have been approved by any committee in any institution in, in the world but at Stanford at that time was approved and started with those ads in the Palo, Palo Alto, uh, you know, uh, weekly, uh, essentially looking for male college students needed for psychological study uh, of prison life, $15 per day for one to two weeks, essentially. So they had a number of volunteers which was randomly assigned to uh, two groups, one prisoners, the other guards, okay? And this was, you know, done, you know, with a lot of uh, fanfare, uh, you know, the guards, you know, were, were giving those sunglasses and uniform. The, the um, basement of the psychology building has been turned into a prison. In fact, even the, the um, beginning of the experiment, the Palo Alto police has been rec recruited to actually stop, you know, in the morning at the homes of this individual, handcuff them, put them in police cars and brings them in. So there was a lot of drama, uh, you know, which, which really made this uh, quite a con con convincing situation. And, and what essentially happened, you know, over a, f a few days, 
you know, these two randomly selected groups, essentially, uh, really fell in, in, into total, totally different behavioral paradigms where the gods es essentially, uh, you know, ma manifested a, a great de degree of ab abuse of the prisoners. And that ability to, to really uh, change behavior under these environmental circumstances uh, really sort of uh, was used to highlight the kind of changes that, you know, ordinary people uh, can be sub subjected to and essentially uh, look at, at a striking transfo transformation. You know, the, the picture from below there, you know, has been, it's essentially from, for Abu Ghraib, essentially, and, and this, this is his situation in the Iraqi, you know, prison, essentially invoked the, the Stanford prison experiment. In fact, Zimbardo himself, who conducted the experiment, you know, was one of the, you know, expert witnesses there. So there was, at that time, a, a lot of discussion, again, about this, ex ex this experiment. Again, experiment, again, uh, open to criticism, but I think there was some phenomenology there which was highly disturbing. Of course, the third element which lurks in the background is the, the issue uh, introduced by Hannah Arendt and again, recently challenged, you know, the banality of evil uh, with respect to, to the Eichmann trial. Uh, you know, the, the question whether Eichmann is an ordinary man or not, He's obviously open, probably not an ordinary man by our def de definition, yet, you know, aren't uh, in invoked this. And essentially, uh, in terms of legal intention, what she was saying, and it will be very interesting to hear comments, you know, later, that Eichmann lacked intentions in so far that he was not thinking. Does court need to prove he intended to commit genocide? She did not think he acted without conscious activity, but thought that thinking should be reserved for more reflective case of rationality, okay? It's a sort of this type of argument, you know, we'll have to, to actually deal with later. Uh, so humans who implement policy but no longer have intention in any usual sense, that's what she thought she was witnessing here. And having intention really means to think reflectively about one's own actions and how they are bound with the thinking and life of others. So here Arendt is invoking theory of mind, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, in a way, okay? And so we'll be interested of sort of hearing uh, what Patrick Hager has to say about it, you know, having studied intention and volition. So that's why we're having all these people here getting essentially away from the comfort zone. You know, as a curiosity, and Eichmann was actually invoking Kant and the judge was, was very curious about it and kind of questioned him about it. And he says, I meant by my remark about Kant that the principle of my will my all must always be such that it becomes the principle of general laws, okay? This was him interpreting Kant in this circuitous way. So, um, in a way, you know, for, for me, you know, the trial, you know, was really, um, and, and, and that issue of a banality of evil and whether Eichmann was ordinary, you know, sort of got into a personal story, which I have in a sense, and maybe I should comment it here, because, you know, in, in 1938, uh, my uh, father uh, was in Berlin and uh, he was at that, at that time a Zionist act activist and he was giving uh, ser sermons in synagogues essentially encouraging people to leave Germany. And one a night, a, uh, a gentleman in a gray coat, uh, you know, came to him after the lecture and he said very kindly, uh, excuse me, or in shooting me, how do you say it in German? Excuse me, Herr Dr. Fried. Can you explain to me the difference between the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud? Okay. So he explained to him, and you know, that person was actually Eichmann, who was very interested in that question. Probably, I don't know how far it is from the banality of evil, but obviously there was an obsession there about you know, the, the Jewish life and Jewish que questions. 
you know, later, you know, to, to finish the story, my father was arrested and interrogated by Eichmann, and eventually deported, luckily, from Germany at that time, because with all the ceremony and, and with that uh, time. So, you know, th that issue of, of, you know, will come up in, 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 in what, is, is it really, you know, is, it, is he really an ordinary man? Of course, a seminal and, and, and really, uh, at least for, for me and I think for many other people, have been uh, really a, 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 a landmark uh, study. And we are really f fortunate to have Christopher Browning with us. Especially the book, Ordinary Man, uh, just um, a, an in investigation, essentially, a study of the Reserve Police uh, Battalion 101 uh, which uh, had a role in the in the final solution in Poland, essentially uh, 500 men, 30 to 50 year old, middle lower class policemen, businessmen, construction workers, was brought. You know, they were not really you know fanatic Nazis or anything. They were just uh, brought uh, and we rec recruited. They were not really fit even for military service, but they were taken to Poland essentially and. Uh, over, over a short period of time, you know, the short 38,000 uh, Jews, men, women, and children transported over 40,000 to Treb Treb Treblinka. And what was, a, what was really the astounding uh, thing for, for many people and, and what Browning pointed out uh, after he, he looked at those men who were essentially involved in, in a trial later in Western Germany, that 80% essentially opted to participate they were not people who were acting in a battle frenzy, and yet they very, uh, very easily, or I don't know easily, but, but very rapidly uh, became essentially uh, efficient killers uh, in, in on, on a mass scale with the intent of sparing no one, hunting down even the last one, essentially. So, you know, in a sense, this was a disturbing uh, doc document, and I think when it was re reviewed in the New York Times, I think the writer uh, was saying, uh, you know, we look at this with the, he used the word, the shock of self-recognition. That was really the, the question, you know, when we read this, you know, always asking ourselves, you know, what does it mean? Well, who are these ordinary men? Is this every man or 80% or 70%? And the, the question which Browning poses, and we were lucky to, and fortunate to, to, to hear him today, why did most men in Reserve Police Battalion 101 become killers, while only a minority of perhaps 10%, and I guess uh, Dr. Browning would probably say to today 20%, did not really? Why? That is, uh, that is the question you know, that we need to deal with you know, at, at other di dimensions, okay? Of course, at that time, the, the, the book, you know, la later, I'm sorry, 1995, was a big con controversy. Daniel Goldhagen's 1995 book, uh, essentially uh, asserting the Germans were willing executioners, not just individual phoning orders, and not ordinary men, but members of an extraordinary political culture with a virulent, hallucinatory, and lethal views of the Jews. And, and of course, this has been criticized, I'm not going to get into this uh, the, the debate now. For me, the, the, the intriguing word here is willing, and, and what does will mean here? And how do we interpret, you know, volition, even in this uh, narrow in interpretation of what actually happened? So what we are essentially dealing with, and what I uh, wanted to reduce the question with, and, and this is indeed a reductionist approach. The reductionist approach is, is what we are horrifically seeing here. This type of situation we do not believe is possible. I mean, it, it meets with an immediate sense of unease and lack of comprehension, essentially. So, what I did in 1996, you know, I sort of proposed, essentially, uh, to look at this issue as a medical issue. And basically, I decided uh, to look at it from a medical model. Because medicine is unique. In, first of all, the editorial, the challenging editorial, was done in a medical journal. But second, medicine has an, an interesting way of dealing with something that we do not fully understand. 
and that is going in a certain way of defining what we see and then trying to make sense of it and hope that our knowledge will improve in the future. So the key thing is a transformation of groups of previously non-violent individuals into repetitive killers of defenseless members of society has been a recurring phenomenon throughout history. And that transformation is characterized by a certain set of symptoms and signs suggesting a common syndrome. Okay? And then I try to deal with it in a, in a medical model. So what are the symptoms which essentially I basically uh, extracted uh, from what was available uh, based on observation? There are repetitive and escalating acts of violence. The individual engages in stereotypic repetition of extreme violence characterized by impulsion to spare none of the victims. Obsessive ideation, meaning, or let's actually go and, 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 and look at this. Uh, obsessive ideation, individuals are obsessed with a set of beliefs often directed against a minority group. So where do we see that? We see this in Ar Armenian, the Young Turks I ideology, Muslim and Tur Turk sup supremacy at that time. The Holocaust, of course, virulent anti-Semitism and racial I ideology. In the Pol Pot re regime, essentially, utopia is the ideology of ideal Cambodian society establishing the peasant as a key to organization of production. In, in, interestingly, all the, the Khmer Rouge founders were actually students in Paris here and members of the Stalinist French Communist Party. Rwanda, who to power, many key players were really scholars and intellectuals who produced an elaborate racial ideology with root in the Belgian colonial era. And then ISIS, essentially the loss of Sharia as they saw it, of course. All Kurds are heretics and the Christians are heretics and we must kill them all. We will show you some, uh, you know, some things later. So this is the obsessive ideation, the perseveration. There is a stereotype behavior which perseverates in face of a changing of changing circumstances. There is a failure to adapt to changing stimulus reinforcement associations. I mean, we know that to the end of World War II, you know, with the death mar marches, when the war was clearly lost, and yet there was perseveration of this. Be be behavior essentially, uh, and that's you know an example of, of this. The other thing I think, which Browning also pointed out, that really those those uh, actions are not done you know by drunk people in frenzy, in the height of emotion, losing comrades in a war situation, but mostly, I think they are done with flat affect. Eventually, they are done with flat affect. So it, it's not it, the model is different here. This, the next thing is really, uh, I think, pointed by Friedlander and essentially uh, the issue of what he called the Rausch, that there is a hyper arousal, a sense of elation with the number and totality of destruction and repetition, okay? And I think, you know, one of the, um, so, so this sense of elation, essentially, I think one of the most chilling documents, essentially, is, is Himmler a speech at Posen, you know, which has in, been invoked you know, many times by, by Holocaust scholars. And uh, well, he's actually talking to SS high, uh, you know, high echelon people. He said, most of you know what it means when 100 corpses are lying side by side, when 500 lie or 1,000 have been born that and nevertheless some exceptional human weaknesses aside having remained decent has hardened us. All in all, we may say that we have accomplished the most difficult task out of love for our people and we have not sustained any damage to our inner self, our soul, and our character. Most glorious page in our history. So there is some elation here with the number of victims, with the repetitive action of killing, and that seemed to me an Im important issue. Really, what about other skills, you know, language, memory, problem solving skills, you know, are, are probably in, intact. In fact, people came up with fantastic, efficient ways of really accomplishing those uh, goals. You know, language is really manipulated in a sense that words are being used which do not really immediately portray the meaning, such as cleansing, you know, things which be become, you know, in dealing with infections, um, you know, this type of ter terminology, 
which essentially re reduces the victims and, and probably creates a, a linguistic and, and environment in which the uh, work can, can be accomplished. And then, you know, what is, uh, you know, also seen, I think, in, in Browning, the description, and I'm sure he'll comment on that, the rapid habituation and desensitization within a short period of time, most individuals undergo desensitization. I think Dr. Browning will probably point to the initial trauma, but that trauma probably serves, you know, as a mechanism of eventual desensitization, because very quickly, there is really con 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 conformity, repetition, and this entire you know, transformation occurs. Compartmentalization, really individual conduct activities seemingly conflicting cognitive states may lead normal family lives that engage in killings of families. We know that. Environmental dependency, dependency on group support and obedience to authority, and the group contagion, the group environment necessary for maintenance and propagation of the syndrome. Responses of individuals serve as stimuli for other members, okay? And hopefully we'll hear more about it. So, you know, really traveling with, my, with this medical model, I had to de define risk factors, and this may not be true, but of course from what we have seen, gender male is a risk fa factor, age is a risk factor, personality factor, very questionable. But then the question of 80% or 70% penetrance, meaning that 70% of the population is really susceptible, that is a question and a disturbing question which is raised. A differential diagnosis that we always raise in this type of situation in medicine, you know, sh we should be separate from the lonely serial killer who doesn't work in a group. It should be separated from killers in frenzy of war. And the question is, what is the smallest unit of uh, the syndrome? I mean, you can say, two in individual, what we saw in Colum Columbine, where we had two in individual, maybe one individual, if to today he's really essentially uh, exposed to all the information which is available and essentially sees himself uh, as part of a com community, an online com community, which we might have seen in the no Norwegian case, uh, you know, of, of, of a lone killer, essentially, uh, who had some ideological Back background, so to, to, to speak. You know, and finally, again, I will not have, uh, you know, and I don't, don't, don't want to get too much into the uh, neuroscience because this is something that I want to throw at you. And I know that Professor Bertos will talk a little bit more about the anatomy and phys physiology of uh, potential structures which are involved. But mind you, this I proposed in, uh, in 1997, okay? So we're talking about what? 1994, a Cognitive Neuroscience Society being founded, right? In the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco, I remember. Only in 2008, effective and social, you know, neuroscience society has been formed. So, you know, these things, especially, you know, affective and, and social neuroscience is even younger, really, essentially. Uh, so, but at that time, what I, I basically propose that there is really um, a essentially orbital frontal and ventral medial prefrontal hyperactivity. And uh, what I propose really is a model of a cognitive fracture, meaning, and I, I think in order to un understand that, perhaps we need to go first, you know, to this model here. And this model of Mac McLean of the triune brain essentially maintains that we really have layers, you know, which have been added essentially in evolution and deep inside lurks the reptilian brain, okay, over which, you know, the mammalian brain and the primate brain are essentially added, okay? And you add to this essentially the Freudian mythology, perhaps supported to some extent, you know, by, neuro by neuroscience, that we do have essentially a, an, an animal brain that we are just holding together under check all the time. And, he, and, and sometimes it just bursts out, of course. And in the culture itself, we refer to these people as beasts. You know, how can you really give medical justification to beasts? These are beasts, these are animals, these are, these are the, the kind of, um, of uh, descriptives that we use, okay? 
Now, what I essentially, the, the general idea was that this is really not a disorder, obviously, of animals, because we don't see it in animals. We may see it in very high primates, and, and we can talk about that. But essentially, um, it's a totally different situation. There is really a hyperactivity of the cortex itself, of the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex is essentially getting out of control and lacks the natural feedback, the visceral feedback, that is necessary for homeostatic uh, ex existence that we are all used to in daily life. So that, that, that uh, prefrontal cortex, you know, probably fed by ide ideology and other factors, essentially goes uh, in, into this period of lack of control from the lower center. So the cognitive fracture is really a situation where you cease to generate emotion appropriate to image conjured by certain categories and stimuli. Essentially, prefrontal cortex functionally disconnected from lower centers and autonomic musculoskeletal endocrine subset of emotion. All this, I mean, of course, we today, we think, I mean, are we going to shoot? Yeah, are we going to be like, like these people? Of course, all our, you know, viscera is going to is essentially rebel against that and give us the somatic signals which will make this type of situation impossible. And the idea is that the amygdala is really shut down by ventral media and orbital prefrontal cortices, hence hyper, hyper arousal on the one hand on the cortical level, that elation, that rouse, and diminished affective reactivity really, where most of these things are done really with flat affect. Uh, so, you know, I was to some extent at that time influenced by the som somatic marker hypothesis of uh, Damascus, which was already out at the, the time, that there's complex decision making is aided by somatic markers, the visceral signals, emotions which guide our behavior. Those somatic marker signals are generated in the ventral medial part of the prefrontal cortis. And, uh, you know, again, you know, I, we don't have time to get into that, that areas in red, you know, signifies that area at the base of the brain, you know, which uh, play a major role in that, uh, in that me mechanism. So that the syndrome itself is a disorder of neocortical development rather than a primitive visceral brain unleashed from regulation of the upper centers, a disorder unique to humans and perhaps higher non-human primates, okay? So again, since then, obviously, we have a lot of, you know, data coming out of uh, affective and social neuroscience, which we must review, of course, with great uh, caution, but yet, uh, you know, there are obviously lessons to be, to be learned. Just in general, two general concepts which will emerge in the conference, I'm sure. One is the, the theory of mind a concept, the ability to attribute mental state, beliefs, intents, desire, a pretending knowledge, etc., to oneself and others, and recognize that they may differ. Obviously, something happened to, to this in the situation that we are dealing with. And then the whole mirroring brain system, the system which code our own experience and are also active when perceiving others having similar experience. Those are almost automatic system, you know, starting with the mirror neurons that we'll probably he hear about uh, of Rizzolatti and, and his group, seeing essentially that uh, the same uh, system which is active during movement is, uh, is also active when essentially movement is being seen in others. And of course, this can be extended from motor to the sensory and the affective component. Do we feel pain when we see somebody else, you know, affected with pain? So this concept, general concept, have emerged. You know, one hypothesis that has been floating, you know, is from, from Simon Baron Cohen, and I'm sure Professor Berthoz will talk about it in more detail to tomorrow. But here the idea is that human cruelty is the result of hyperactive empathy circuit. And only individual with low empathy can attack and kill an another person. Empathy shutdown may be a function of genes, early experience, circumstances, in our case, zero degree M empathy in a case like Columbine high school killings carried by, by two individuals. So uh, I'm not sure that the hypothesis deals very well with what's happening in groups. 
but definitely it's a challenging hypothesis in terms of what happening within an individual. And all those structures, which really I don't want to, I cannot really go into this detail, especially in such a large group, uh, but he uh, sort of has orbitofrontal cortex and other areas in the frontal lobe uh, and in the temporal parietal junk junction and other areas, and of course with the amygdala, as part of this uh, huge circuit. Um, now, of course, you know, having proposed this, I had to think about how we can test the, the, the hypothesis. I was thinking about hysteresis, the study of persistent abnormalities outlasting the expression of the syndrome, meaning that we can study people who were involved in this, measures of affective re reactivity, measures of perseveration, measures of prefrontal arousal, and study smaller units of the syndrome, such as something you can see it in gang me members who has a certain ideology which excludes others, essentially diminish others. But essentially, the creative situation today is to can we really create complex virtual reality, you know, neuroimaging studies where we can actually study, and I'll just bring you one example to kind of tease, tease it, uh, essentially. And then the issue that we will be dealing is really prevention effective only at early stages probably, recognizing the symptoms in a society or in small groups, all the symptoms which I, I mentioned, and maybe isolation of affective individual and small groups, a syndrome cannot propagate without contact between individuals. Now you may think that this is a dream, I mean how are you gonna isolate uh, you know, affected individuals? But I'll give you an example essentially. Uh, you know, so first before I give you the example, I'll tell you what, what I got after I you know, took this, this out, essentially. So obviously there was co correspondence, and here is a criticism. The last time I saw the, the picture there was in the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem a few years ago. It left me profoundly depressed at my helplessness to do something, this is from John Faber you know, from King's College, uh, at my helplessness to do something for the desperately unfortunate Jewish mother and her child and at the depths of degradation to which human nature in the form of the pitiless German soldier could sink. To see the picture again in the Lancet above a caption indicating that the soldier was showing the sign and symptoms of syndrome E left me incredulous, he said, and justly so. I mean, that's uh, you know, the natural reaction that we have, okay? And he, you know, he goes further, and I'll present it to you because it's valid. Clearly mentally ill killers, however dreadful their crimes, need help. Nevertheless, when sane ordinary people mercilessly murders dozens of helpless and innocent people in dreadful circumstances, the full opprobrium of society should be brought to bear upon them. To label such morally degenerate behavior with a pseudo-clinical label such as syndrome E must represent the ultimate in our society's trends toward denial of personal responsibility. I hope Mike Gazanica is gonna talk where responsibility is, right? Okay, however admirable the intentions, the soldier will be seen to be suffering from syndrome E. So that's again the Hippocratic model. I mean, in the Hippocratic model, we treat people that we empathize with, right? And this is something different, really, medicalizing. So, you know, our guest from Oxford will give us, I'm sure, some views of that. But here is what happened also. I got a, a, a letter after that from a surgeon uh, who, uh, who was a Canadian surgeon, uh, B. Arm Armstrong, who was de deployed in uh, Som Somalia in 1995. Runs, you know, uh, 1995, around the, the, the same time. You know, what happened there, there was p Canadian peacekeeping forces that came there to, to really ma maintain the peace. And something bizarre happened that, uh, that he noticed. He said that the people underwent some kind of change and they sort of started uh, de de developing all those impression and prejudice against the, uh, the Somalis. And it, it ended up in, in, in some violent activities, including you know, specific killing that happened and you know, got a lot of uh, attention in Canada. Here are the peacekeeping forces. And, there were, and he, saw, he said to me uh, in, in an email, hey, basically I think that I saw the type of change that you are, you are trying to dis de de describe. In fact, it's interesting because he tried to attribute it to an anti-malaria agent, uh, you know, fluoroquine, which apparently has some be behavioral side effects, but 
again, this is just, you know, a side story, but meaning that you can see those things on a smaller scale, and obviously they can, you know, they can pro propagate. I'll end with two things. One is really the question of can we create virtual situations where meaningful re result can be obtained. So this is really just from a, a uh, paper that was published just a few weeks ago, okay, by an Australian group. And here, they basically put the subject in a virtual situation in, in the FMM MRI, where they, they were themselves soldiers, and they were shooting under three conditions. Soldiers, harm, you know, harmless civilians, and nobody. These were the three conditions. And, uh, you know, essentially, and the title is, the, it's interesting, title, the neural correlates of justified and unjustified killing, an fMRI study. Uh, where would you see that? So, um, in a sense, you know, the way that uh, in fMRI is done, I'm sure Professor Singer would love that, right? Civilians minus soldiers, everything is linear. So when you take the activation that they, that, that the brain was activated in the civilian con condition when they're shooting a civilian, minus, you know, what happened when they were shooting a so soldiers, they really saw this, you know, two dots that you can see on the upper part. A, a, this is the, the bottom part of the, the brain, the ventral part. It is really orbitofrontal, the lateral orbitofrontal cortex. And this is really, to make it short, it's, 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 it's an area associated with, uh, with guilt. Very interesting. We've seen such a complex emotion, you know, can it be represented really in one uh, space? And again, everything ties with one another. I had a, a patient, uh, you know, recently who um, for two years had this un, um, just remarkable episodes of a, of a feeling of guilt just came on and went off, okay? And uh, since somebody in her family was a psychotherapist, then she was subjected to psychotherapy for two years, who didn't exactly achieve the goal. And then it was discovered these are actually seizures, okay? These are auras, really. And, and you know, I ended up putting electrodes, and, and, and indeed, you know, it was coming from this general vicinity, the seizure. So activation in that area, you know, in, in this kind of situation, caused this sensation of guilt, which was not associated with any topic. It was like, this was general sensation of guilt, not guilt because I did something, indicating that there is something primary about, you know, guilt, which is not necessarily related to a particular event. But in any case, so the other area which was affected here, uh, and it's qu qu quite interesting, you will notice that a uh, point of red in the temporal lobe uh, on the left side, it's clear, uh, you know, the one on the very left, and, and you can see it here on the ventral side of the, the brain, this thing at the bottom. You know, this is essentially an area which is involved in the process of visual stimuli, and it's really close to an area which is the face area, essentially. So in this particular situation, when they were looking at faces of civilians, these areas were really activated. While they were looking at soldier, you got activation of the lingual area, meaning, you know, much more primary, you know, visual area was activated. So it's, so essentially the brain is assigning meaning, essentially, by this processing, assigning meaning to a civilian. In a sense, you know, it is, in a way, a dehumanization versus humanization, you know, issue the activation of the facial area, you recognize faces, okay? So this was another difference when they compared the ac activation of uh, civilians, shooting civilians versus, uh, you know, shooting uh, soldiers. The, the final area was the con connectivity with the temporal parietal junction, which is obviously involved in theory of mind uh, models, you know, etc. Et 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 so basically, um, I, this is an example, really, of how we can deal, perhaps, with studies of this kind, okay? We can look at, at anecdotes, we can look at, at uh, in interviews, at the same time we can create this type of, uh, of uh, models. And finally, I want to end up 
And I think we need to see, see that as unpleasant as it's going to, to be. You know, this is a video uh, that was uh, shot uh, a few months ago by Itai Engel. It's actually an Israeli co correspondent and was shown actually on Israeli TV. And he went to uh, Iraq and, and spent some time with the Kurds there and happened to interview uh, people uh, who, uh, who were involved in ISIS uh, ac activity. This is available online also. Uh, so I took it from, from, from there. It will also have some shots, you know, which are di di disturbing, you know, of what ISIS has been doing. Sound you have. Okay, so, you know, obviously this was done by people who were in cap captivity, but, uh, you know, I think it does uh, give you some, some, some imp impression, you know, of per perpetrators in this situation. So I want to end up by saying, you know, what kind of questions, you know, we're posing to you essentially, you know, I sort of send an email saying, uh, we send an email saying we don't want your latest and greatest research. We just really want you to, to put your, you know, thoughts into these specific questions. How do ordinary individuals become capable of undergoing such extreme change in behavior to repetitive killers in groups?
in neuroscience dialogue with the human and social sciences lead to new insights? Could there be a relevant biological model? And can anything be done to meet the challenge of prevention and containment, essentially? And I think, you know, while we're talking about what neuroscience can, can do, I think we can talk about all this element, you know, perception, does it change? Dehumanization, humanization, vo volition, what is the meaning of will, really? Simple and com complex affect, you know, what, is the, how, what role do they play? What is the decision-making process which goes into this behavior? What is the role of beliefs, concepts, and associations you know, which are formed? What is the role of empathy? What is the definition of self and other in this type of situation? What is the individual dynamics and the group di dynamics? Uh, are we not erring when we're trying to medicalize this type of behavior. And fin finally, the issue of responsibility and judgment and the relationship of uh, neuroscience and the law, which are obviously uh, all uh, Im important issues. So I uh, will you know, end you know, with this uh, unanswered question and just as a little uh, vin vin vignette, why are we doing it in Paris? You know, one of the best sellers here years ago was the book Sy Syndrome E which obviously may have been inspired by the article as I learned from the author, but obviously took it into a totally different, you know, suspense story. So I'm not ad advocating re reading this, but this was the association that we have, you know, with Paris uh, here at this time. Thank you very much. I do want to end up, you know, with this uh, quote from Steinbeck, which I think is, is really, uh, I like this, because it says, there is a crime here that goes beyond denunciation. There is sorrow here that weeping cannot symbolize. There is a failure here that topples all our successes. And I think what we're trying today is just to understand it a little better. Thanks.